this is the West Riding. Go up into its wild stretches of moor, seek out a town in one of its steep valleys, and you'll find a people with a life and ways of their own. Just above the great mill where the high-piled lorries are forever beginning and ending their journeys, that's where I was born. Wherever I stood, I could see the mill below me, with its smoke-blackened walls and roofs. Just across there was my home. We lived in a small stone house in the middle of a row, in the middle of streets all exactly the same. Here, my mother waged an endless war against the smoke from the mills, scrubbing, washing, and polishing. For like all West Riding women, she would stand no dirt in her home, inside or out. Hi, my mother's always been a worker. She's brought up a family of ten. Two of the girls and three sons in the forces is not so bad. And even now, she still helps out in the mill sometimes, when they're short-handed. You see, before she was married, she used to work as a mender, and she's never forgotten her trade. My father's job is perching. That means holding cloth up against the light to spot any faults in it. He's worked in Mr. Armitage's mill for 35 years, and I reckon they must have handled a good million miles of cloth in that time. We Sykes have been a textile family all through, as you might say. My brother Harry's in the combing room, in charge of seven machines and the girls that work them. Aye, the mill's a rackety place. But if you want a quieter corner, you'll find it in the pressing room. This is my brother Tom. All day long, he moves backwards and forwards, leaving the cloth as smooth as a billiard table. Back among the clatter of the looms, you'll find our Edna and our Annie. They say they get used to the noise and manage to talk by lip reading. In the warehouse, the cloth lies all bailed up, ready to be sent out into the world. My Uncle Joshua's in charge there. When I was a lad, that was the only part of the mill I could get inside. And to get inside the mill where everything important seemed to be going on, and where everyone in the West Riding seemed to work, that was my greatest ambition. In those precious moments after bringing Uncle Joshua his tea, I'd wander around looking at the names of the places to which our cloth was going. New York and all the states of North America. Cape Town, the mysterious lands of Africa. South America. Canada. Soon all this cloth will be on its way across the sea to be touched and worn by people of all nations. I would go back into the street, wondering if I should ever see any of these exciting faraway countries. For the West Riding seemed a very grim and drab place to me then. Now I've grown up, I've learned differently. I've got a tandem. At least I have shares in the back seat. 
We're great cyclists in the West Riding, you know. Every weekend, wind, rain or snow, and it's generally one or t'other, we get on our bikes and leave the smoke of the towns behind. And when you're out with a club of 50 or 60 lads and girls, strung out over the moors with the wind whistling through your ears, you just can't help singing. <laughs> Rough, sweeping hills, crowned with dark rocks and purple heather, miles and miles of lonely moor, where the curlews dip and call, and the great winds tear across the sky, driving the clouds before them, bending even the stubborn heather. That's our country. The wild novels of the Bronte sisters were born in these moorlands. Wuthering Heights and Jane Eyre were written about these lonely houses and the brooding loneliness of the West Riding Hills. Yes, it's a hard country, especially on the tops. But follow the trickle of water which starts under a boulder. Follow it down from its remote moorland cradle and it'll lead you through lovely valleys where every bend in the river reveals a village of old stone houses and men who work with their hands. Now the sheep, grazed on the rough expanses of the fells, are being rounded up. For the beginning of April is lambing time, and the Dalesmen must move their flocks to the sheltered fields nearer the farms. stretch in endless straight lines across and over these dales. The people who first enclosed the moors are forgotten, but the walls are repaired each year with the same old skill. Dry stone walling is not easy. You learn to find the right shaped stone when you're a boy, and so the craft goes on. village here and there, you may still find the besom maker, binding bundles of moorland ling together to make brooms and packing. As village follows village and the river widens, the rough moors are forgotten in the quiet of gentle meadows. rich in water, as the monks of old knew well when they built their abbeys, like Bolton on the wharf. You wouldn't call the West Riding easy farming country, but the short sweet grass which grows in the limestone dales and the rougher grasses high up on the fells can pasture many sheep. Already 10,000 sheep in Yorkshire and their wool was being shipped as far away as Italy when Skipton Castle was built 600 years ago. The Earl was rich with wool. He carved above his gate the word désormais, or as we might say in Yorkshire, we shall do it 
whatever the opposition. A motto still graved deep in the hearts of this stubborn and independent Moorland people. As I got to know West Riding better, biking through it and talking with people, I began to understand how it was that this great textile industry, with its smoke-black towns, had grown out of the heart of our hills. For one thing, our position on the maps got a lot to do with it. Now, here's the West Riding, right in the heart of Great Britain. Here are the ranges of the Pennine chain, and from these hills and moors run the fast-flowing rivers, here and here and here. That's meant there has always been plenty of water to make power, water to turn the mills, water in every village to scour and dye, and wool on the hills, all that was needed for making cloth. People were weaving cloth in the cottages and villages of the West Riding Hills 700 years ago. Some folks say longer than that. The weaver worked at home in his own cottage, or in a mill by the stream. The loom stood in the upstairs room with its many windows to give him light. When his piece of cloth was woven, the weaver threw it over his donkey's back and set off with it down the rough pack horse track and over the pack horse bridge with its low parapets so that the cloth would swing clear. And so to the market. For hundreds of years, in homesteads tucked away in the folds of the moors, the West Riding men wove their cloth on their own looms and were their own masters. Then the bouncing lid of a boiling kettle pointed a new power, steam. All over the West Riding, the new machines began to turn and once again the raw materials were close at hand. Towns grew and spread and joined with each other. Towns born for one purpose, the making of cloth for the whole world. And so the great body of weavers began to move down the valleys to the new mills, for they couldn't compete against machine-made cloth. They had to leave behind their old pack roads among the heather. Their cottages beside the streams were left to the mercy of wind and rain. There was no longer any life for them in the hills. At first they resisted bitterly, for in the mills they would no longer be their own masters. But the world needed their skill, so they came at last to the towns and mastered the machines. They achieved more than any of them had ever dreamed, and in so doing won for themselves new opportunities to enjoy their countryside. In all this change, the people remained as they had always been. Sturdy, independent, eager to make the most out of life in any surroundings. Take any textile family. My family, the Sykes. They'll be having their evening meal just now. The pretty's wasted, I've known Miss Trail. I mean, I've never tried to catch it. What have you come to ask, dear, I said? Why, sir, just to fly my pigeons. Yeah, better <laughs> Yes, my father's pet hobby is flying his pigeons. On a Saturday afternoon, he'll take them anything up to 30 miles away and set them off and watch them head for home. That's how you train racing pigeons, by taking them further and further away from the place where they were reared. Dad loves to watch them drop in from the sky after a long flight. Sometimes he races them from hundreds of miles away, sends them to places where he's never been. He's won quite a few pounds at that game, but I reckon he gets most of his pleasure from just having them around and caring for them. On Saturday afternoons, you'll find our Tom and Harry out following a different sport. Football's their game. They know all the players in the home team and they judge every move in the game with the eyes of experts. Ah. 
and the match doesn't end on Saturday. The inquest often continues for the rest of the week, in the mill or the street or anywhere handy. You'd think my brothers were deciding the fate of the world, the way they argue about football. They're still hard at it when I get home from cycling, but then there's always plenty of talk at our table. We all fancy ourselves as experts at one thing or the other. Uncle Joshua, he plays in the Mills Brass Band, and our Edna, she's a star in the town's amateur dramatic society. They're doing Jane Eyre this time. Do you think because I'm little, obscure, poor and faint, I'm also soulless, heartless? I have as much soul as you, and more. They got the wrong page. The wrong Not page just on these now, pillars. Harry, I'll be with you in a minute. Right. Do you mind, everybody, please? I want quietness. Sorry. Now, Edna, do you mind, on this line, I have as much soul as you and more heart. No, do you I put see. more feeling into that? Just try and prove it. Do you think because I'm little, obscure, poor and plain, I'm also soulless, heartless? I have as much soul as you and more heart. And if God had gifted me some beauty and much wealth, I could have made it as hard for you to leave me as it is now for me to leave you. Oh, I'm not talking to you now through the medium of conventionality or of mortal flesh. It is my spirit that addresses your spirit, just as if both had passed through a grave and we stood at the feet of God, equal as we are. As we are. <laughs> We've some tidy performers in our family, and I'd say we're pretty typical of the West Riding. We'd all rather stand up and do a thing ourselves than pay to watch others. Our Annie does a bit of singing in the chapel choir, but once a year we all let ourselves go in Handel's Messiah. It's us through and through. It's music we understand. striding for them. They are not smooth or gracious. They have no tricks of manner, nor ways to flatter. They are not swift of fashion, nor easy to bend. But the heart within them, as their own moors, is spacious. Their heads are not bowed, and they go. It will not matter what danger opposes or threatens. They go on to the end. 